Well, I'm a little overwhelmed. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, Evelyn's really interesting and speaks to a lot of people I know. So, Thank you um, also for inviting me to give the Stephen Ambrose Memorial Lecture. I'm really honored um, to have received um, that request. And I want to thank Patty Borneman for all the wonderful publicity. I think that's it. Drew in this crowd. Yes. Okay, I'm going to start the slideshow. The slides are not linked to my talk. So they'll just cycle through. They're the slides that Montana Historical <coughs> Society has available for viewing. But of course, they're all of Evelyn's slides. And then I have some at the end as well. A frontier photographer and a naturalist. In 1889, a genteel English woman and her naturalist partner left England to live among, along the Yellowstone River in eastern Montana. Despite the challenges of supporting themselves in an unfamiliar and wild land, Evelyn Cameron became a photographer who captured the beauty of river bottom and bad land. And you and Cameron compiled the first bird lists of the region. Whether or not they were married is controversial a question that actually initiated the writing of the first chapter in this book. However, what is more important is how this resourceful couple managed to not only survive on the frontier, but support and inspire each other in living extraordinarily creative lives. So who are the Camerons, and how did they manage to survive in the harsh conditions of eastern Montana when thousands of others came and went, as well as developed their interests and talents? Evelyn Jeffson Flower was born on August 26, 1868, in London, England, to a merchant father and a musical mother. She was the eighth born in her father's second family, with three surviving older brothers, Severin, Percy, and Alexander, Alec, and an older sister, Hilda. As part of the upper class, Evelyn and Hilda <coughs> received a good education. They were educated by a governess, however, rather than the private schools their brothers attended. The girls' studies included art and languages, French, German, and Italian for certain, because Evelyn wrote in all three in her diaries. She also sketched, painted, and illustrated. Evelyn's mother composed music and played the piano well. Artistic pursuits were valued. Although Evelyn didn't attend college, she read every spare minute she had, intentionally continuing her education. Ewan, on the other hand, attended private schools in England as a boy and college in Belgium. Ewan made his own choices, it appears, as both his father and brother, Ellen, were Oxford educated. Not much is known about Evelyn's childhood. We do know she was a natural tomboy, preferring riding horses and hunting to domestic activities. Her penchant for adventure led Evelyn to Ewan Summerlid Cameron, a family friend who was 13 years her senior and married. Percy hunted with Ewan on the Orkney Islands off the north coast of Scotland, where Ewan lived. Evelyn may have visited Ewan's wild retreat as well. It was likely Evelyn who suggested she and Ewan travel together to eastern Montana to hunt big game. Years earlier, before the railroad was through, Percy had hunted along the Yellowstone River as far west as Miles City. When the Camerons made the trek, they had the advantage of the Northern Pacific Railroad, which they took to Miles City. Ewan Cameron wrote a long six-part series about the most exciting incidents of that year for a British publication called The Field, the country gentleman's newspaper. This well-documented piece establishes that Ewan was taking notes and had a talent for writing. His voice is strong, the style a bit formal, British. His description creates images, he recognizes drama, and he depended on the two men who were guiding them to establish authority. Here are a few excerpts from that series. You need to know that Monty and Lisk were the guides they've hired, and they've been several days hunting in the Missouri breaks. About six o'clock, after skirting some groves of cedars, we emerged upon the top of a high divide, beyond which was a small plateau of some fairly open prairie. 
Lisk joined us here. He had seen nothing, not even a fresh bear track, but he told us that close to where we had assembled was a curious bit of ground that would repay a visit. So we followed Lisk at a quick lope to the end of the divide. Here were several acres of vividly blue badland clay, which is really Cretaceous marl and can be of any color. The earth has been formed into pillars and pinnacles by the action of water and frost, and upon these, red sandstone rocks were perched and balanced in haphazard fashion. In other places, blocks of sandstone were piled in confusion at the foot of the Marl Buttes, looking like the ruins of old red fortresses that have been thrown from their mounds. And here's another section from their trip back to Mal City with two bear cubs. They've killed the mother. Note that Yoon was already compiling data on birds. We arrived at Mile City on April 9th at three o'clock, having made 23, 25, 30, and 18 miles respectively. The only specimens collected at our journey's end being a pair of Kildur plover. These birds had now commenced to arrive and ran aimlessly about calling to each other after the manner of plover. Our young bears created quite a sensation in the town, and people flocked from all quarters to the stable in which they were confined. Ewan went on at length about the species of these bear cubs, concluding that they are but color varieties of the same animal. This series was published in the spring of 1891. Obviously, when the Camerons went home to England from their hunting trip, Ewan spent his time writing. He wrote all his articles out by hand, then at times, Evelyn recopied them for him. The third installment was illustrated by a sketch of the bear cubs chained to a log, which was taken from one of Evelyn's photographs. So already, Evelyn was providing photos for Ewan's articles. It would be years before she received credit. If I could describe the arc of their life together in Montana, it would be like this. Evelyn and Ewan moved to Montana to live in the fall of 1891. Evelyn had just turned 23. Ewan would soon be 37. Ewan was still relatively healthy and would be for the next 10 years. They rented a place in the Pine Hills on the Powder River for two years, living among British expatriates many who remained their good friends for the rest of their lives, especially the Dawsons, Mr. Price, and the Archdales. In 1893, they rented another place south of Terry, Montana, in order to be near the railroad from which to ship their polo ponies. In this period, Ewan was managing their finances, although Evelyn had a say in her trust funds from her family's estate. Ewan was not a good money manager, so by the time they returned from their year in England, Evelyn had taken more control. In 1900, the Camerons go back to England to live for a year. The trip was motivated by Ewan's health. He might need surgery and wanted to consult doctors in England. In late summer of 1901, Ewan having received a bill of good health, they returned to Montana and made plans to build a place on the north side of the Yellowstone River. This was the only place they built, and it was well set up for Ewan's bird studies. He described the setting thus. In 1902, I built a ranch in Dawson County amidst pines four and a half miles to the north of Fallon on the North Pacific Railroad and moved over there. The house is situated below some springs surrounded by pines and cedars where I placed three water troughs all species of birds inhabiting the pine hills of eastern Montana visit them to bathe and drink. The north side was where Evelyn took her remarkable series of photographs on the golden eagles. Sam Undham, a local shepherd, told them about the eagles eerie. Their visits were well documented in Evelyn's diary. She recorded the eggs, the baby chicks, the fledglings, Ewan scoped the Erie out for the first time on March 19. Over the next four months, Ewan or Evelyn visited 16 times. In early April, Evelyn made her first trip. To Eagles Erie, fruitless. 
too windy to stand on ledge and photo, photo it as intended with my last 4x5. Her 4x5 was in reference to her glass plate negative. Three days later they returned and Evelyn used her plate. She often noted the shutter speed and diaphragm setting in her diary, as she did here. By 9.30 we rode off to Eagles Erie, other side Cottonwood Creek, and I used my last plate, one second and bit, 16 diameter and shade of rock. She flew off. On occasion they took detours to show one another interesting geological formations. Ewan got horses, dinner one, we started. Ewan took me between and against curious sand dunes twixt head of gulch rims to cottonwood. I took him on trail and against indented sandstone rock which banks west side of Cottonwood Creek. Eaglets. Had to poke them about with tripod. With a stone, I made one nearly have a fit. In late May, Evelyn began printing the images for an article, Nesting of the Golden Eagle in Montana, that Ewan was writing for the Auk, a well-regarded ornithological journal. Ewan complimented her efforts. Ewan looked at prints, was quite excited over them, very good batch. Seven of Evelyn's photographs of the developing eagles illustrated the article. Ewan described Evelyn's efforts to secure photographs. The eagle's eyrie was situated near the top of a scoriaceous rock in the Badlands, a crimson pillar which crowned a high butte sloping abruptly to deep washouts. Placed in a hollow niche of the wall face, the eyrie was entirely enclosed and sheltered on three sides by a dome of rock. It was possible to climb to a north ledge of the rock, immediately over and about a yard from the eyrie, but the whole pillar behind was seamed with a gaping fissure which threatened immediate collapse, while a sheer precipice yawned into the front or west. From this precarious position, the accompanying photographs were nevertheless obtained. Their last recorded visit to what Evelyn dubs Ego Rock was on July 8th. Evelyn took a few more pictures. Put up lunches, two eagles eerie, saw a biggish young bird sitting on old gnarled cedar, east of the divide west of nest, photoed one in nest. After lunch, took photos by sand rock and on my wrist. The apex of Ewan's work, the first comprehensive bird list for Custer and Dawson counties, was published in the AUK over three installments, spanning over 63 pages. Reading from it makes a bird watcher wish they lived 100 years ago, except there's a lot of shooting of birds, apparently without limits. Ewan listed 191 species, adding field notes on each. On the pintail, Ewan wrote, I have several times seen a flock of these graceful ducks arrive at close quarters. Although much larger than green-winged te teal, their light and graceful evolution resemble the latter. When, attracted by water, they swoop down to it as if to settle, but again shoot upwards. If satisfied that there's no danger, they straggle into the pool, uttering a very soft, low quacking and immediately on arrival, begin washing, playing, feeding, and walking about. Mr. J. Alex Frazier of Glendive informs me that he saw about a thousand migratory pintails in different bunches on one day of September, 1906, at L. Stilson's ranch on Cow Creek, Dawson County, where some of these ducks pre breed and are protected by the proprietor. Al Stilson was an early conservationist, it appears. He had good company. Many of the ranchers protected the birds. Whether this was partly Ewan's influence is hard to know. Ewan did stop ranch hands from shooting birds at times. On the snowy owl, Ewan wrote, Snowy owl, erratic winter visitor, in some years abundant, in others not seen. During the winter of 1889-90, there was a regular invasion of snowy owls, and J.D. Allen, taxidermist, Mandan, North Dakota, 
had 500 sent to him for preservation, which I examined in May 1890. On my trip to the Missouri Breaks from Miles City in April 1890, these owls were commonly seen all along the route traversed. I've titled this talk A Frontier Photographer and a Naturalist, but in essence, Evelyn was a naturalist as well. She didn't employ the technical language that Evelyn Ewan did, but she was a keen observer and she continued to learn. On a page from her 1884 diary, when she was 16 years old and living on her family's estate in England, Evelyn documented, the aphids probably breed more rapidly than any insects, frequently bringing forth their young alive, unlike most insects, which usually lay eggs. The writer watched one under a microscope. It gave birth to two within half an hour and they would probably in the course of two or three days begin to breed. They multiply so fast that Professor Huxley calculated that the tenth generation from a single aphis would be heavier than 500 million stout men. <laughs> Evelyn learned how to use a camera and print photographs under the guidance of two different boarders, whom they took in between 1893 and 1894. In her diaries, she recorded photographic failures and successes, camera settings and darkroom technique. Because her first camera didn't have a reliable shutter, Evelyn manually gauged how long to leave the shutter open to let in light. These references were more common in the early years, helping her develop a body of technical knowledge. Evelyn already had a good eye. She cultivated her skill. Just as Ewan did to correspond with his brothers, other scientists, and editors, Evelyn depended on the mail service. Her early cameras arrived by the mail, her darkroom chemicals and tanks, often from Eastman, and glass plates all came through the mail. She ordered her diaries year after year from London. Her sister sent her newspapers and magazines from England. When either she or Ewan returned from Terry with the mail, they read voraciously. Evelyn wrote to her mother that English news is so well reported in the American papers and if you live near the railroad it is received two days after the event, almost as soon as in the highlands of Scotland. <laughs> in one instance Evelyn had terribly bad luck with the British mail when negatives from the first seven years of photographs taken between 1894 and 1900, ended up lost. As far as delivering finished prints, sometimes Evelyn rode to the subject's house to show them proofs, at which point they placed an order, or the subject came to her to see how the photos had turned out. One day, Alec delivered proofs on his way to Terry. Alec took, Alec took two proof prints to Mrs. Burt, and I wrote a note as they were both no good. Child moved. <laughs> Evelyn also mailed photographs if the person lived at a distance. A month after mailing Monty a picture of the butte he fought Indians from, he was dead. Ewan came to bed late and told Evelyn he read in Stock Grower's Journal that poor old John Montaigne died of pneumonia in Terry their first hunting guide, gone. Although not as many or as long as Ewan's articles, Evelyn published as well on a jealous Tom Turkey, ranch pets in the Northwest, the cowgirl in Montana. Evelyn wrote an informative human interest piece in the Breeders Gazette titled Sheep in Montana. She began, there is no sweeter music to me than the bleeding of lambs and the cry of the curlews on the hillsides. These sounds, the elixir of life in spring, denote that winter has at last relaxed her cruel grip. The troubles of the sheep man, however, are never really over, for after passing through the rigors of winter, the anxious lambing season in May is upon him. 90% of the lamb saved is considered a highly satisfactory average. Our neighbors, Undam brothers, 
have reared 95% of their lambs. The golden eagle is the only winged marauder and occasionally takes a woolly prey in the nesting season. A pair of the royal birds built their eyrie close to our ranch and have been spared at our request by our courteous neighbors in spite of the fact that they took some of their lambs. This article was beautifully illustrated with Evelyn's photos, which were finally attributed to her. In 1907, the Camerons moved back across the river, eventually buying a ranch where they spent the rest of their days. Their lives were a bit quieter in, the, in that they don't take long hunting trips, rather they trekked from the ranch. As before, Evelyn's chores were many. She prepared all the meals, baked bread, did the majority of the domestic chores, including laundry, grew a large garden for themselves and to sell, cleaned their house as well as the outbuildings, cared for stock and fowl. She also helped Ewan preserve specimens. Blue eggs for Ewan, five sparrowhawks and one flickers. Aided in identifying birds, slept in the barn when they had raptors to care for, hunted rabbits and small birds to feed the raptors, wrote out Ewan's articles for him, and pursued her photography. At the end of the day, Evelyn wrote in her diary. Of course, we know all of this because Evelyn kept a diary. This fall, I read Kate Van Genderen's master's, master's thesis on Evelyn Cameron and came across terms that I found useful as well as intriguing. Van Genderen's term for some of Evelyn's work is emotional labor. It's a bit like what I think of as women feeling responsible for the emotional health of their families. We spend a lot of time assessing the overall, overall health of our family members, making adjustments. That's why a dark room, a greenhouse, an office, any private space can be a relief, a chance to catch our collective breath. Evelyn had this chore as well, attending to Ewan's physical and emotional health. Ewan did not keep a diary as far as we know, although he must have taken copious notes to write such detailed articles. Sometimes Evelyn commented on what Ewan was up to, completed his chores, or wrote at his ornithological notes, or spent the morning at his desk. During their winter in Scotland, Ewan worked on his wolf article, sharing it with his brother, who also studied natural history. Ellen and Ewan corresponded their entire lives, comparing notes on birds and mammals and on their health. It was Ellen who accurately diagnosed Ewan's brain tumor four months before the Camerons traveled to California and the doctors there confirmed it. Ewan corresponded with scientists at the Smithsonian Institute and the Biological Survey in Washington, D.C. After Ewan's death, Evelyn shared details of his accomplishments with her cousin and trustee, Ralph Flower. Ewan's hobby was natural history more especially ornithology. He was a contributor to the IBIS, the AUK, Country Life, and several American periodicals. I illustrated his articles with photographs. Dr. C. Hart Merriam, head of the Biological Survey, wrote, what a pity it is for such an able man and such a good and useful citizen to be stricken in the prime of life. His contributions to the ornithology of Montana will remain a monument to his memory. In a letter to her mother, Evelyn shared an outside opinion of her talents. She wrote that Ellen met the editor and photographic superintendent of a country life who spoke in very flattering terms about my photos. And he, Ellen, reported their remarks to me, which was of course very gratifying. Having disappointed her mother when she chose a life with you in Montana, one can hear the hope that her mother has forgiven her and can appreciate what Evelyn's accomplished. We certainly do. I hope I've given you a partial picture of how the Camerons supported one another in their professional and artistic endeavors and what made the Camerons such an intriguing couple. Overall, they remained engaged and devoted to one another their entire life 
I certainly enjoyed returning to them while preparing this talk. I've brought some articles of um, Ewan's and Evelyn's that are on this table, as well as a little photo album of a visit we made to her third home site in 1997. Since then, the cabin has collapsed. It's, um, and a trip we made to Scotland when we had a daughter studying abroad there to do research. That includes Evelyn's first home with her family and their place up in Dornick when they lived up there. <laughs>